Hi everyone, I'm Marie and we are coming to you live from Living Felt because it's Happy Wooly Wednesday! Oh, and thank you so much for joining us today. We have been having fun watching you all check in. If you stumbled across this feed, welcome to the live show. We are Living Felt based in Central Texas. And if you're checking in over the live chat, say hi and where you're from, join in. You can see we have friends all over the world and we're grateful to every one of you for being here. On today's live show, we are going to Needlefeld, our hidden lake landscape. Last week, we made the mini together and this week we're going to translate those ideas into a larger format. Uh, we'll be working in the circular round today and it is going to be a hybrid show because in order to grant jam all of this into about an hour we have some pre-recorded segments that will help us so I hope it's helpful for you all and please do say hi this is an interactive show you'll get a chance to ask questions share your own ideas tips and tricks and I already see some of that is happening over there so thank you all so much. Hi to Helen in Staten Island, Peggy in New Mexico, Jane in, um, where are you Jane? Oh, in Louisiana, just across the border over there. Linda's in Tennessee, says she's loving working on her new WOW felt pads. We'd love to hear that. Kathleen, uh, I think you were the first to check in in Oregon. Thanks so much for being here. Diane, all the way in Washington. Sharon in Canada. Hi to Christina in Poland. Audrey in the UK. Meredith in Florida. And every single one of you, you make our Wednesdays so fantastic. So we're looking forward to sharing today's show with you. Um, we have a couple of lovely fairies lined up just to jump you into supplies for this tutorial. And the first up is the magical fairy, Alyssa. Woohoo! Yay! Yay, Alyssa! Yay! Okay, so today Marie is going to be working on our 100% wool felt fabric. They come in 8 by 12 sheets and also larded, sorry, large, <laughs> large yardage cuts. They can be found on the wool felt tab of our website. Okay, up next is Fairy Ann. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Hey friends, thank you so much for spending your, your time with us today. Uh, so that we I wanted to share that today's project is a kit, the same kit from last week, will support for the project today. So your the kit is gonna come with all of these beautiful colors of wool a 100% wool felt sheet background like Alyssa just showed, and a six inch embroidery hoop. And if you already have a hoop on at, at home or you wanna display your pieces in a different way, uh, you can get the kit without the hoop as well. Totally up to you. And uh, if you already have all the fiber on hand, the pattern and instructions are available as a PDF download, both the PDF download and the full kit can be found at the link in the description. Thank you so much. Next up, it's Fairy Marie. Woo! <laughs> I'm back. Did you miss me? <laughs> we are jumping right into our tutorial today. Fairy Kayla has the jokey day off, so I'm sorry that you miss her comedic antics, but we're so glad that you're here with us. So again, today we are going to be needle felting what we call Hidden Lake, which is just a fun, sort of whimsical, folksy, kind of not so realistic landscape, but it has lots of interest and we've already seen that in the minis people have taken them many directions including one with a little mini Nessie so really fun if you're not in our Facebook group you might check that out lots of fun happening over there people sharing all kinds of felt works but they've also been sharing their little miniature landscapes and as I mentioned we do have we needed to prepare video for today's lesson because there's so much to do that you can't get it all done in an hour. We're going to be taking you through the entire process and then we'll pause in between certain segments to answer your questions. So we're gonna jump right in since there's so much content to cover and I'm excited to share it with you. Those of you who have uh, made pictures us, with us before, you know the very first thing we need to do is to prepare our workspace and in this case get our image onto our canvas. Now Anne showed you um, the she gave you the kit in the she showed you the kit in the handout you get a couple of line drawings and a couple of completed inspiration images so we're going to use the line drawings um, to get us started and prepare our background. Okay, so once you have your line art, whichever you choose, you can trace over a picture or your chosen line art, you start utilizing your pen and trace over only the lines you want, or you can add new lines 
wherever you want. So this is regular printer paper. You can um, trace right over the diagram that is included in the kit, or you could trace over your own image as well. And again, I kind of made up different lines as I'm going along and choosing what I want. And again, it's just regular printer paper if you do the PDF. So if you're using the hoop, be sure that you leave yourself a little perimeter there for mounting. So at least an inch if you can on either side, and this works fine with uh, the miniatures that we included in the kit. Hot, dry iron, hot is setting, and I'm transferring my image onto 100% wool felt like Alyssa showed you. And there you get my imprint. So it's just 20 seconds per space. And now because I'm using a hoop today instead of a square, around my outer hoop or the one with the um, mounting nut, I am tracing along the inside to get my perfect circle. So choose your inspiration image, whether it's your own picture, another picture you felted, or your minis. And we're going to use those just as our jumping off point for making our picture today. The wool, this is the wool that comes in the kit and we're using MC1, Bergschaff, and Maori. My first color is Caspian, which is a turquoise color for my sky. And I want enough to cover my sky in really a single solid layer. I want it to go behind my mountains and behind my trees. So you see here, I'm just gauging how much I need and I pull off the excess. We're using fine needles today, 42 triangles in a cluster single, a cluster and single, and then 40 triangle needles as well. I'm not using anything heavier than a 40 triangle. You can use your hoops to help you frame out your piece. If you use the inner hoop or the smaller one, then trim around the outside of it, not on the inside, because ultimately the picture is going to go over this little hoop this little hoop goes under your picture. So you can use either one, but if you use the little one, trim on the outside. This just gives me a little barrier or frame so I know where to go. And we want to needle felt all of this wool nice and flat and flush and even before we add any other detail like clouds. So when you get your little perimeter going there, pull off some excess, and then you can just fold it back to that little line that you drew and needle felt it down. You don't want it to be overly bulky so that it doesn't create too much space in between the two hoops, but it is a nice way to kind of go about it um, and use those hoops as a little guide. So you'll see from time to time that I like to use my frame or my hoop to kind of push up against almost like the cookie cutter method, but in this case, I am using the larger hoop. I'll just move that nut around so that I, it's not in my way or I'm not trying to needle felt into that little gap. So needle felt everything nice and flush. Okay, now I wanna go behind my trees and behind my mountain, but I don't need too much bulk. Remember, if you did the mini with us, and if you didn't, we'll uh, link to it in the description so you can watch last week, that um, you just want to have little thin layers and you can go over those lines so that everything layers really nicely and you don't see the direction of the wool. Since we're working with short fiber MC1 batting right here, you don't really see it because the fibers are so crimpy and all mixed up, it works great. If your fibers are longer, you might have to mix them up. Now with the clouds, y'all just have fun. The clouds are fun to lay in there. They are um, never the same. You know, the minute you take your eyes off the cloud and then the minute you look back, they already look different. So don't get too stuck on the clouds. Lay them in, let them sort of guide you. This is our bright white CX2 winter white and it's so white and it's also a little hairy and a little wiry, which I think makes for perfect clouds because you're gonna have some clumpy areas and you'll have some thin areas just like clouds. 
Now check this out. You can cut out your picture or whatever image you're using, bring in little cutouts like this so you can envision your shapes and see if you like what's happening. So from time to time, I'll bring in a little cutout and layer it on top just to make sure I'm getting the layering of the subjects in my picture like I want. So it's just a little helper. And then if you squint, if you step back and you kind of squint, <laughs> then you can get a vision of it and see if you like where it's going. Needle felt your clouds down. Again, I'm using my 42 triangle. Um, you can always change your clouds and you can rip this wool out if you don't like it. But you'll see that some areas are thick and some areas are thin. And I think that makes them look just a little more realistic. And I like how they look. So now we want to do our mountains. The blue mountains, I did exactly like we made them on our miniatures. I'm using our majestic blue and I'll make a couple of blends so that we get a few different shades. Your mountains could be blue or purple or black. The cover image on our kits, they're brown and yellow um, and then the blues are in front. So have fun with this part. I blend the white and the blue so that I will have a slightly lighter colored mountain. If you were looking at a distance, things kind of actually lose intensity in color as they get further away. And then I'll blend black, or you could do like a very dark gray with this same mixture so that I get a second shade. Okay, people are liking the cutouts. I'm glad to see that. Very good, very good. Okay, so this will bring us our second shade, mixing these two together. And your blends can be very homogenous or they can be kind of modeled like mine. You can always layer other colors on top and even just patch in certain areas to add dimension and shape. And then lastly, I'll just blend Majestic with the black onyx so that I have one more shade. This picture is really designed to be like a toe in the water, so have fun, don't overthink it. We're going to freeform our mountains here um, and just tack them down in place. The lightest mountain is the furthest one away. And remember just to allow your things to overlap each other, but keep where they overlap to be rather thin so it's not too thick and bulky. And then I tack just the darker right along the bottom. And I'm doing just a hint of an outline around these mountains because of the white in there, they kind of fade out into the sky. And this is going to be an almost indiscernible trim, but something that, keep, that kind of grounds them, if you will, in between the sky and their existence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now again we're looking like, okay, my mountains are about in the same place and I want to add my little yellow hills. In this case, we're using this sort of golden -y, uh, sunshine yellow that comes in your kit. And I'm going to make a couple of blends again. I don't want them to be this strong of yellow, so again, I'm going to do a blend with the white. And this will not just lighten it, but actually brighten it. So do your blends and pull out the chunkiest bits of white because we're not trying to look like we have snow caps on this thing. We just want it to be a lighter yellow. And you can see the two shades there, the original and the one that we're doing now. And again, we're just free forming this little set of hills. So give it swoops and noops, you know, with your felting needle at first so that you get some shape to it. And once you like it, then go around and tack it all down. Everything in this picture is actually very flat. It's not going to be poofy and have dimension. You know, if you wanted to put it in a shadow box, you could, but I wouldn't personally leave it loose. I would make it compacted and thick. Um, loose wool is gonna grab onto dust, or dust will grab onto your loose wool, whichever way you wanna think about it. And it would be very difficult to clean if you didn't make everything flat or um, compact it. So if you want it to ha have puffiness and dimension, build wool on top of wool instead of leaving it loose. Um, but all of my picture is going to be very flat. Okay, then we're going to pull off the excess. Notice you always got to hold it in place. Again, we're working with short-ish fibers here. Um, if you're working with long fibers and they won't pull apart like ours, then cut them because you just don't need them in place. 
And now I'm taking a little bit of that light brown and blending it with my blend so that I just have some different shade happening there on the lower part of those little foothills. Loops and dupes, Pamela says, is that a new technical term? I, pre I think it's an old technical term, <laughs> swoops and dupes. <laughs> okay, great, very good. So here again, I just lay things down like in a draft and then I'll tack it all down. So just get this all nice and flush. And I'm showing you here just that I'm making this all nice and flat and that there's no dimension to it at all. A quick peek, and then the next thing we'll be doing is our tree stand off to the right. So before we begin that section, are there any questions we should address and knock out from these first two little videos? Yes. Alrighty, so firstly, we are loving the cutout patterns. Oh, We're fun. loving the, the tip about the embroidery hoops. Oh my gosh, game changer for so <laughs> oh, many good, of us. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, use, use everything you can at your disposal for assists. Not cheats, they're assists. Okay, good. Like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kelly asks, would you say that for felting needles, the 40 to, or 42 triangle is all you really need for this project? I, I like it personally because I'm patient with this process. I'm not in a rush. I probably wouldn't go beyond a... Um, 38 triangle myself but you can go to a 38 star if you want the thing is we don't need it to go further into the mat we want it to compact and sit onto the top of that felt sheet so when I'm doing compaction I feel especially with all the great resistance you get from the wow felt pads that a 40 triangle is very effective or a small cluster of 42 triangles if you're willing to go around and tack down I would rather have a cluster that compacts like this than a single needle with more push so it's just a personal preference mm -hmm. And then in comparison with the projects from last week, how much bigger is the project this week? Oh, well, last week we had a two and a half inch square and this time we have a six inch circle. So it's not too, it's not too much bigger. Here's our little piece and then here's what we did last time. So a two and a half inch square, it's, it's a little more than double, I guess, right? A little more than double. Mm-hmm. And last question. Yes. In the handout for this kit or mm -hmm. this project, is there an image included already that is designed to be cut up and used as the pattern, or should we make a copy that we used to you cut know, up? You know, there is an extra one in there. So there's a cover image and then there's an internal image. Do you have a copy of the pattern with you, Anne? Let's see if I have one. I, I, I do. don't. I can grab Okay, I don't have one right at my fingertips, but Anne's gonna grab one. So there are two images, and you can cut one of those up if you if you like. And I suppose you could just make a make a copy if you wanted as well. Oh, thank you so much, Anne. Okay, so there is a there's a cover image, and then there's a slightly different image on the inside. I mean, every time I do this picture, it's different, quite honestly. But here's a secondary image you could use, and so you could cut that one up if you prefer. Just if you want to get rid of one, then cut one up. Yeah, so there's one you can use for sure. And I did see that someone else asked, is the pen, and I think they also asked, is the hoop included in the kit? The hoop is automatically included in the kit. You can opt it out if you don't want the hoop, and the pen is an optional add-on, right? They can just click up, they can, you can just check a, check, check a box and add the pen on. Mm -hmm. Great question, y'all. Is that it? We are ready to move Okay, on. let's rock and roll. Let's do our trees. Uh, I think next is our trees and our bushes and um, maybe our field even. Here we go, y'all. Okay, this is, oh, I'm on the wrong one. Sorry, party foul. Okay, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Okay, so for our stand of trees, like last time, we're using the Bergschaff Evergreen, MC1 Evergreen, Leaf, a lighter green, and black. I am trimming my evergreen trees in black. This is totally optional. I just like to give myself a little foundation to work on here. And it's very easy. You just anchor one point, drag it up, and then I bend it around the tip of my needle, anchor that point, and then needle felt down the other side. Um, and you're just gonna 
you know, Charlie Brown your way up and down those little spikes so that you get your trees all outlined in black. Totally optional. But it does provide like a little back um, color, low lights, if you will, uh, in the background. Um, okay. When we do our last tree over here, notice we're going over the front of the mountains there, so you'll be glad if you pushed a little extra wool across those lines um, because this will make it look overlap. Now this stand of trees is in front of the foothills, is in front, all that stuff is on a distant shore. I left a little space here to show you if you decide you don't want a full stand of trees or if there's an area you want to fill in, just go ahead and fill it in with your sky color right there. If you have the batting, it's so easy to do little tiny patches anywhere in your picture that you want to cover something up. And um, as you'll see later, I end up putting a tree here, but I wanted to show you, you can patch in color or, or layers wherever you like. Now we're going to do a quick demonstration here on the trees. Uh, someone asked, is the MC1, is the black the MC1? Yes, that is our black onyx, but really you can use any black. My head's gonna be in here a lot, y'all, so forgive me. Okay, so my base color is MC1 Evergreen, and that just gives us something to put all of our layering on top of. MC1 Evergreen, a thin layer, uh, just nice and flush. If your wool is short like ours, break it off at the bottom because you don't want a bunch of bulk to tuck back in. But if yours is long, just cut it with some sharp scissors. Make that nice and flush. And then we're going to add a little shadow to the right side. Again, this is not like technically correct. Have we sourced? Where's our point of light? In my picture, I'm putting the shadows sort of to the right of the trees and the highlights to my left. So I'm blending the black, the same black and evergreen, and I'm going to ghost a little side shadow over there off to the right, always using my 42 triangle. Um, Sierra says, needle felting seems to make her wrist hurt. I never have that problem. I don't know if maybe it's the angle or something that you're sitting at, but I never have a problem with my wrist at all from needle felting. So it's just as easy as writing. So if you can emulate your writing style, if you don't have problems writing, then try that. Leaf green is going to become the middle of our trees. And notice with this batting, how you can lay this little wisp of a layer down. It's like, it's like a little see-through layer, and that's why putting our base color is so helpful because we can put just a little web of this lighter green right up the middle, and it's, this is already going to add some dimension to our trees. So that's just our straight leaf green in the MC1. And off to the right, I'm using whatever little light green you have. In this little scene, I'm using a Maori light green. We also have a more limey, yellowy light green. And just put these little webs on until you're happy with how it's starting to make your trees look and be shaped. If you use, if you web it out when you lay it down and you poke it gently with a fine needle, as long as your base layer is already flat, then you can kind of tack it into place where it is without spiking it too much. If your base layer still has a lot of air in it, then you're going to be creating dips and points and stretching of that top layer of fiber when you tack it down. So let your base layer be flat before you start adding these extra layers of color on top. Now for any trees that I've tucked in the back, I'm using the evergreen and black mixture. And this is just gonna say, this tree's further away, just pushes it to the background, and then the trees with a little more highlights or variants to them are towards the front so that they all just don't look the same, like our little trees did last week off to the left, and that was intentional. So fill all your trees in however you like. And remember, see or notice as we're building this picture, we're going from the back to the front. So everything that's in back first, for the most part, and then building on top of those layers. Okay, so fill in all your trees until you're happy. And here we bring in our little guide again of our picture. And now we want to make 
um, our bushes and or our fields, so whichever you're comfortable with. But before I do that, I want to go in and see my horizon line. Your horizon line is almost like the viewer's eye line, if you will. And right, we're gonna ground those trees and ground that distant shore by putting in a hairline, little bit of a black line. As you work, don't worry if this gets covered up sometimes because you can always go and put it back, but it helps keep you in check of where everything is. So it doesn't have to be straight across because the, what you're looking at may not be straight, a grove of trees or a distant shoreline, but it does represent that plane of land that you're looking at. Well, I'm gonna jump over here to the right and make my field. I'm going to mix this yolky yellow and this limey green together to make this field could just be grasses or grasses and flowers, um, patches of whatever, and so I want it to be modeled and not 100% homogenous. We're going to begin this field right beneath our little grove of trees back there. So while it's kind of hairy and wispy, try and tuck it underneath that little black line that you just laid down. And as we build this shoreline, or not, it's, it's going to be the shore and it's going to be, or the bank, the bank of the lake, if you will, and it's also this field off to the right. We're going to create some character in this bank by creating these little jutting out points as the land is curved. The land curves in and on itself. It's not straight. And we're not viewing it from straight overhead. We're looking at it from where we're standing, which is just on the opposite side of the little cluster of flowers in the bottom of our picture. So notice that we're just going to create these little jutting out points. And I will go over this when we, we break here in a second to talk about that perspective, um, to give you a visual to use in your own space. But notice how we're covering up areas and not creating a really visible um, curve as if we're viewing it from the top down. And then fill in all this area over here just to give it some character. And if you let those mottled colors dance around, then you're gonna build in some characters and hills and dips that you can play with as you start to add more detail later on. Okay, I'm reading some of your, um, Carol likes the shading in the trees. Thank you, Carol. Um, Y'all are giving each other tips on needles. I love seeing that. Melanie says she ordered last night. Can't wait to begin. Okay, so let's drop in some bushes over here. We're going to be using the evergreen, either one you want. I'm going to mix in some, we're going to use evergreen, evergreen and black, and then we're going to use our lighter greens as well because we're going to build a little cluster of bushes. And I've done these a few different ways. I've made them completely lighter and um, darker, whatever you want. But again, we're just going to free form our bushes. So while it's poofy and loose, use your felting needle to kind of guide it and give it dips and curves. And then needle felt that kind of in place, but in this case, I leave them a little poofy as I bring in some black and green blend. I'm gonna drop in some areas of shadow so that it's kind of a spontaneous. It's like you throw down some color and then you needle felt it and see what shapes it creates. And then we'll go back and we'll add some more dark curves and we'll add some light highlights. So it's not very technically correct. It's just a way to get some character without overthinking it. Pull off that base there, that's gonna be our distant shore, so don't let that get too long. We've covered up our black line, but again, don't worry about it, because we are going to, um, we're going to add that back when we're ready. Teresa's liking the jewel tones. <laughs> Gaia says, mixing colors, it seems all I do anymore. <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> That's fun. Okay, so here I'm adding some black swoops. So when you're looking at bushes, really you have clusters of leaves, and this is far away, so we can't really see all that detail, but there's pockets that kind of just go back to the branches or whatever's behind it. So I'm just putting in some 
black curves, not straight lines, black curves. And then we're gonna do the same with the green, some lighter green curves. So just, it's going to give it a little bit of dimension as if the light's sort of landing on the top of some clumps of these bushy thingies. <laughs> Bush, bushy thingies and leaves over there. <sighs> Getting close to the end here. So have fun with that on, the, on your bushes. Try not to overthink it. You can always just plunk some wool down in spots and tack it down and see if you like it. And if you don't love it, you can probably pull them back up as well. So get all that nice and flat, spend a, little, a few minutes needle felting it down so that you are happy with it and you have everything in place. Mm -hmm. Fine, looking good so far. Okay, probably at a little um, breaking point here, Anne. What do you think? <laughs> do we have any questions we need to tackle? Well, so we had a fun, uh, we were having a fun discussion in the comments. Some folks were sharing their experiences about getting really thin straight lines. Uh -huh. uh, some folks were saying that, asking if we have any tips and tricks for really achieving that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Connie shared that a big game changer for her was using MC1. Oh, nice. Yeah, it, it can really depend on what fiber you're using. I mean, most fiber is going to have some crimp to it. If you watch uh, the last video, and I even think when we had the wool video, so a couple of weeks ago, we had a little video where we showed using a few different types of wool, and I was sort of starting a little paisley design, and I showed how to do some straight lines. But one of the things that's going to happen, you know, with any fiber that you have, is that it's a certain size, and the key to getting that straight line is going to be, can you control what I call drafting? Can you control teasing it out and if you start with anchoring one point and then you know draft the fiber out and tack it down as you go it's going to be easier to get that straight line so you can check out um, last week's video where we did this little picture in real time right where mm -hmm. we, we did straight lines and then a couple of weeks ago where we went over a few different types of wool because we did demonstrate getting straight lines with a few different types of wool I think we showed that on there because we were filling in a little paisley so check it out cool anything else Okay, so now we're going to block in, this is a pretty fast one, we're going to um, block in our water and our, um, we're gonna block in our water and where our little flower field is going to go before we add any more character over to our field of yellow and, and green over there. This is pretty straightforward. You are going to just tack that water in place and go into all those little juts of your land Make it just just as thick as you need so that you don't waste too much fiber um, because you may want to use that fiber blending somewhere else. And you do want this to be all nice and smooth, laying down well before we add any other colors on top. This is just a process of patience right here. Um, and a cluster of needles or a little multi-needle tool will probably really be your friend when you're filling in these big areas. Um, and a, maybe a good show, <laughs> whether it's a radio show or a television show, but make it all nice and flat. And then we're going to um, fill in our little color blocking for our field of flowers. And here I'm using the um, Bergschaff evergreen and Maori evergreen mm -hmm. the Maori evergreen and the black because I want it to be a nice dark backdrop for those bright flowers that we're going to put in okay so just cluster this down and notice that um, it you again you can use your hoop to kind of help give you a good perimeter but when it comes into the water our flowers are going to be kind of poking in the water so we don't want a real straight line there they're leaning over we want it to look a little more organic there okay so we have these major color areas in place and now we want to add some character to our water, to our shoreline, and to our field. And thanks for your patience, y'all, as we go through all of this. So now for the final time here, at least I'm going to put in that little area where that distant shore meets the water. That thin black line can be so helpful visually to 
tuck that point and make it seem far away. And also on this distant shore line, there is um, some highlight on the water there. It may be um, just a reflection of the clouds. It could be some activity of the, the water. This water actually bends around behind that front grove of trees. Those two land masses don't meet. You can't really tell that by, this, by the perspective in this picture, but the water actually bends around to the other side of that yellow field and behind those trees. So I'm blending some blue and the white because I don't want it to be too, too strong white, but we're going to drag it just in this little tiny channel there and tack it gently on top. So again, we're just trailing the fibers and it's not a solid blend, it's a web. Think of it as an open web so that we're allowing the blue to show underneath. In truth, you could blend and lay down a, every layer of color in a picture, but if you give yourself that base color, sometimes it feels like you have a little more freedom to move around on top and add those topical designs. So here we just have these couple of ghosts of white going right across. And then we're gonna add some depth to this body of water and some interest. Melinda says, how do you know when to do a, back, a dark background first? And Melinda, it's going to help when you have stuff on top of it. So whether it's trees or what's going to be the flowers down in the, the bottom right corner, you don't wanna to have to fill that in. You need the stems and the, the flowers to stand on top of it. So if you give yourself a dark background first, that'll give them something to sit on. Um, okay, so for this blend, y'all, I'm doing about, I'm adding a little Caspian to the MC1 Evergreen and not the other way around. We're not adding Evergreen to Caspian. We're adding a tiny pinch of Caspian, like a third or a quarter even, to the Evergreen. The Evergreen has a beautiful blue-ish hue to it. And this is going to give our body of water some depth, especially where we're closer to it and we can kind of see what's happening. You can kind of look into that water and see a little more of what's going on. We're going to be adding a lot of character here, but what I like to do is just lay down, again, it's like a draft. Patch it all down, let it sit right on top, and then you can kind of sit back a little bit, squint a little bit, <laughs> and ask yourself, are you seeing what you want to see in here? In this case, I'm happy, so I tack it all down, and we're going to get some character going in our shoreline. I'm going to blend some colors here. I'm working with the light brown and white, uh, yellow, um, where the, the white and the yellow, sorry, the light brown, the green, and the dark green. And we're going to use almost all of our colors here to take what is kind of a flat shoreline, a flat field over there, and give everything a little more interest. So notice we blended two greens and now we're blending a brown and this is going to give you some really earthy goodness. So often I think we try and work in just one pure color, but the blends are going to add a lot of dimension and playful realness <laughs> in this not very realistic picture. And what you see here is I'm just clumping these little bits of color along those little jutting out points of the shoreline. Um, we're just going to clump them down because the grass is kind of mounding there on the shoreline. Where we're standing, we can see like little lumps and clumps of grass, um, and that's what we're putting right on the shoreline right there. And before we get to the end, uh, I remind me, Anne, that we'll swing back and talk about, talk about that detail because we're going to be adding it here in, in just a minute. I'm just gonna cover up a little bit of that distant line where the trees uh, meet the field, add a little bit of growth there, a little bit of bushes, just to kind of break it up. And anywhere in the field, if you allow yourself to just squint and look at it, you might go, oh, I can imagine that's a little patch of clover over there. I could imagine that's a little patch of flowers. And you wouldn't be able to see the individual flowers from a distance, but you might see a little cluster or line of white, a little cluster or line of color, and if you got right on top of it, you could tell what it is. Okay, right here along this shoreline, I'm going to tuck some dark green 
in there and we're going to start getting getting a little bit of interest right where that shoreline meets the water and notice that we're only applying this level of detail of color on the part of the shore that's facing us so the one that we're facing, we can see one side of that curve of the landmass, but we can't see both. We're not viewing it from top down. We're standing at some point and the land comes out and covers what is behind it. I hope that makes sense. Does it sound clear? I demonstrate it. Um, squinting is a cool tip, Colleen says. Squinting helps me a lot. Yes. Um, Laura says, felting in 2D reminds her of painting an oil painting, but without the toxicity. <laughs> okay, now over here in the field, I'm just going to add a little bit of character. A clump of brown is going to give us, you know, a little dip in the landscape, and then some lighter, you know, the yellow blended with the white, is going to give us a little rise in that landscape. So again, play with that and add some hills, bumps, lumps, into your little field over there um, until you're happy with it. <laughs> Karen says this is peaceful to watch. Devin's taking pictures with her phone <laughs> as we go. <laughs> I, I, I do the same thing. I've done that to Bob Ross. I've taken pictures. Okay, y'all, we're going to drive into a little bit of detail here. I have taken my brown and my black and I am tucking it along the shoreline just on the side we're facing. Hairline, little tiny bits of the black and the brown. Where the, that bank, where the earth meets the water, it's a little more muddy. And you have that little exact join point that might look just a little bit black. So remember, don't do it along the entire curvature only the part that is exactly facing you because you can only see one side of those little juts of land mm -hmm. and tuck those in there. Now we're going to then add, let's see if I do it right here, we're going to then add a little bit to the water as well and I'll see where we do that. I'm just tucking all this into place and I think it's right here. Okay, so where that water meets the shoreline, very often that's where the water is the most shallow. Like if you're going to see a shorebird, it's there. If you're gonna see a turtle, it's there. If you're gonna see little minnows, it's there. So sometimes the water's just a little bit muddy right where it meets the bank. Things are a little bit closer and this is where you are standing, not the distant shore, but right there where you're standing, you can see a little more in that water than what is far away. So it's, it feels a little murky as soon as you start to put it in there. You can imagine that a little bit of algae under there, it's just a little bit of sliminess, which is like, Good lake should be. Good lake should have a little bit of sliminess on the rocks where the water doesn't move as much, right? Right along the bank. It's not, it's not so active. So when we add that brown, then I like to go back and I'll tuck in uh, another little black line wherever the brown has also blended into the water. So again, just a little hairline fracture of that black where you've added brown to the water to keep that separation between the shore and the water. Okay, peeking one more time and now let's get some clouds into our lake. We're gonna do much like we did the sky and that's like try not to overthink it, squint real good, step back, lean back. We're gonna drop some ghost layers of this webby white onto our lake and what I want to remind you of is these clouds that you're looking at reflected in that water are not really those clouds that are way behind those mountains that you're looking at where you're standing. These are the clouds over your head, right? They're kind of like straight above you. These are the clouds you're seeing. So don't overthink trying to match those clouds that are way over there behind those mountains. The sky's big and you can lay it down, tack some in place, go back, add some more. 
And again, this is really uh, wiry, so here at the end I'll show you too how we can cover up some of the wiriness if you don't like it. I think it works great, but I always like to go back and add a few more clumps in places. And if there's anything you really don't like, you can always take it out. You can always take it out, and yeah, you'll have to needle felt the stuff that was beneath it down again, in some cases put things back if you went too far, but when you're working in a little 2D like this, you can change your mind. You can absolutely change your mind. Thank you all so much for playing with us. I'm really glad you're here. Um, Carrie says, it's weird. You think you have finished, but by taking a picture, you can see a different perspective and where you need to work more. And I completely agree with that. Absolutely. I have the same experience um, all the time. Okay, so now look, I'm bringing in a little of our Caspian and a little bit of our light green. We're going to go with one more tiny, just suggestion of a reflection in a couple of spots along our bank. Just a little bit. We're going to see where that mounded hill is sticking over a little bit and reflected into the water. And it's just going to add a little more liveliness to our picture um, and interest, I think. So step back often, you know, and um, bring in your hoop wherever you need to. It's going to help make your picture look a little bit cleaner, uh, help give you a little bit more perspective, and make sure you tack everything down really nice and good um, before you move on to adding more detail on top. Good. Okay, so I've enjoyed, I've been reading a little bit, and I know Anne's over there working as well. Do you have some questions, Anne, that you've gathered up? Or comments? Um, what do we got? Mostly comments. We're all feeling very uh, lulled and inspired <laughs> at the same time. So it's a it's a fun kind of magic today. Uh, <laughs> the, the biggest game changer. I think we're going to see some really beautiful landscapes start oh, popping. I'm up excited. Yeah. The way that you're approaching the shading with just adding, showing where to add in that little bit of dark line to really just make it pop and all of a sudden you're going from needle felting a picture to being in that world and seeing, uh, being right there well i i hope to learn too because i'm not a landscape artist i mean i've never studied some of y'all said you know it's reminding you of school like i've never studied at all so this is just amateur hour here teaching you and if you have fun then my day is made that's that's all i really want is to see y'all have fun and and express yourself. So should we move on then? Nothing to, nothing mm -hmm. to, okay, so let's get to kind of the final phase here. And we're going to um, add some little stems for our flowers and then get our flowers in place as well. Pretty quick here. We're just going to draft up our greens and little thin lines, greens and browns, and you can even go yellow or blend the brown and the yellow. And remember that when you're looking at this little cluster, in this case of flowers, and you remember what the name of these flowers were? Celosias. Celosias. Like C-E-L-O-S-I-A. And right after I shared this landscape with her, she saw them in the, um, in the floral department mm -hmm. <laughs> of, the, of the store. Um, so, what you're seeing here is that the stems are going to go in all kinds of different directions and so let them be free spirited and you don't need too many but you definitely want to add that body we're bringing in two pinks for you two pinks included in the kit and the first one is this little what is this color called Anne? that is begonia oh yes begonia so this begonia it's uh, a maori yep in the maori line is a fun little pink and it's what I used last week in our picture was just the Maori. Just remember that your flower heads are going to be pointing in all different directions. These are like a kind of a little, they're almost like a little fire flower in that, you know, they're, they're pointing up like that. They're wispy kind of feeling, pokey at the top. They remind me of red hot pokers, but oh. pink, you know, red hot pokers go up pointy like that. And they're gonna point in all different directions. So layer them, try, try not to leave too much space for each flower head so that it's like flower here, flower here, flower there. Let them step on top of each other. Let them just bang into each other because that's how they would look if you're standing there. And some places you couldn't discern one flower from the other flower. And don't even worry about attaching them to those stems so much. The stems are just going to become, again, an inner layer, if you will, 
behind all those flower heads because your eye is going to be focused on the flower heads probably instead. So we use the berg shaft and then we drop a little bit of this hot pink. Hot fuchsia. I, yeah, hot fuchsia. I love this color in our PFM pre felt. So it's the brightest pink thing we have in the house, right? Like I couldn't find anything else that had the pink that I wanted. And so we drop a little tiny cut uh, from it into the kits so you can variegate your flowers a little bit and drop that shock of pink in there and really make them pop and add dimension. So fill in your flowers, don't be shy, get them all in there, and don't leave too much space in between them. This isn't a royal garden at the English palace. This is like a wild little area. And here we're looking at, in our hoop, uh, we have everything all lined up, and you're gonna to wanna to go around your picture and add detail where you want. And here's where I promise to show you, if you're not loving some of the webby of your white, if it looks too webby, then take a thin layer of like something like the Caspian and lay it right over top. So anywhere we need those final bits of touch, like I'm gonna tuck a little dark behind my foothills back here just so they stand out from the mountains in front of them. Now's the time to go over your entire picture, um, decide what extra details you want, make sure that that whole circle is filled in and you're happy with it. Um, especially before you cut it out. But now's a great time while it's all laying flat. We don't tear the picture off the background. We'll try not to until we're finished because then you have a little more dimension. You know, the picture's laying flat now and it's perfect. And if you're using the wow pad, um, then it can handle all that wool that you push into it. And if you use fine needles, uh, like I'm using today, even if you're using our Earth Harmony foam, it should hold up pretty well. If you get aggressive with your needles, you're more likely to tear up your foam. Um, but in this case, with the fine needles, we're going to do pretty well and not ruin anything. So again, I'm going within one last line. I know we're pushing right up on our time here, um, but there we are. That's like the finishing touches and you'll wanna go around your whole picture and flatten everything out and get it nice and tidy and flush so that you're happy with it. Cool? Cool. Okay, now we promised to show you. So last week I didn't show you the back of my foam and we, we promised that we would show it to you um, this week. So let me get that queued up here for you. Here we go. Okay, so here's my picture, just like I left it. I mean, if, if I had more time, I would probably fuss over it a little bit more, but it is absolutely attached to my felt pad. So Anne can attest, this is going to be the first, the very first removal off of the WOW felt pad. So I think it's like magic because look at that. Look at how little color is left on my felt pad. Now someone asked me to see the back. There you go. There's absolutely no fiber that's come through the back. This is clean and the back of my picture um, has a fair amount of wool on it, but not as if I had used foam. If I'd used foam, so much more would have pushed through the back. So once your picture is completely needle felted, you can give it a nice steam press. And look, you can steam press something and you can then, um, you can steam press something and then go back and needle felt it some more and steam press something and go back and needle felt it some more. I want to remind you that, um, Ironing does not felt. <laughs> ironing does not felt. So people will say, well, can't I just iron it? And I offer you the reminder that ironing does not felt. It is, it's a compression that those fibers can easily loosen up. But you can iron everything down and get a nice, get it nice and smooth. And then when you're happy, you can mount it in your hoop. But you can absolutely go back now, needle felt stuff more, and you could even take a little bit away if you just hated that cloud mass. Like I, would, I keep looking at that cloud going, I don't want you to look like that, but there it is. Okay, so now with our hoop, you'll know why we, we left that perimeter and your hoop can point either way. I think hopefully soon we'll invent something even even better than the hoop. I don't know, but it's for now, it's something. And look, you can stain your hoops. You can make them a different color if you want. I just have a little bit of room here. And this is why you don't want the perimeter to be too, too thick, um, because then it gets a little bit more of a challenge to felt, I mean, to mount. 
And if you're not happy with the fill-in that you get, then you can take it off now and go back and fill in that a little better. But you have room to pull this tight before you finish finish and make sure that you like how it looks. When you're ready, there's a couple of things you can do when you're completely happy with it. You can either cut it so that it's kind of flush with your hoop like this, or if you have enough room, you could leave, you would need a little more to room here on the top. But if you have enough room, if you're using a different fabric or something, you can fold it down and glue it to the inside. Um, the felt tends to have more bulk and wouldn't fold as neatly as like a piece of linen would, something thinner. So you might find that you want to cut it, or you might even want to glue it before you cut it so that you know it's anchored in place. And then final, final, if you want, you can back this with something and put your name on the back or, you know, mount this with like a black paper and have your name badge or whatever on the top so that it is your signature. Now, some people will sign their artwork right here. I'm not that famous that I <laughs> sign my artwork, but... There you go. So cut it when you're ready, and if you're not ready, then just go back and give it a little more, a little more detail and a little more dressing till you have everything like you like. I do want to offer one more, one more final tip, just um, for little areas of cleanup. So I'm going to zoom in because I promised to do this last time, and then if there's any questions, I'll I'll answer them. Anne's nodding her head now. If you have lines that you don't like, get yourself a nice little sharp pair of scissors because sometimes I'm gonna have lines that I don't like and it may even be that this cloud is connecting to this cloud and I don't like it. You can snip it out of there and if you just break the line, then you can go back and um, get that one going where you want it to. Now I don't needle felt on the hoop, but you get the idea. The same up here in the trees. If you don't like a line like here where these two trees are coming together, you can patch a little bit of wool right over that line, a blend, and it'll look a little more blended. So snip things that you don't like, put another blend, and here on this land mass, I just wanted to show you this one thing. Hold your own thumb in front of you. Oftentimes when we do a shoreline, we will draw that shoreline like this and put in all of the curves and the detail in it. But this shoreline we're looking at like this, like I was showing, I was trying to show this to Anne earlier. This is like the land, and then these are little like thumbs that come out. We can't see this part. We can see this part. So when you, this represents like this little thumb right here. So we can't see what's inside so much, or maybe it's like this, but you can't see the whole thing. So don't trace that dark line all the way around. Put it on the parts facing you and let these little parts be mounds and hills. Okay, that's what I had. What do y'all have? What are final questions do we have? We have uh, a few questions and then a few shares as oh, good, well. Oh, good, 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 good. Um, so the, one of the questions that we have is if we're going to put it in an embroidery hoop, would you trace around the felt and um, then remove the, remove the hoop to be able to cut out the coffee I don't. access? I just cut it off while it's on there. I'm going to get it where I want it exactly because each time you're going to stretch it a little bit differently. So I'm going to kind of get it where I want it. But you might want to you might want to glue it to secure it before you cut it almost all the way off if you really want to make sure that it's not going to budge. Mm -hmm. What else? Kelly asks, do you find that the wow, fat, wow felt pads um, hold up better for this type of 2D picture work? I like them better for 2D picture work myself. I like that less wool is going through the fabric into the pad. I'm wasting less wool because less is pushing through to the other side. I like the resistance that it pushes back because all we really want is for the wool to sit on the felt. We don't want it to sit on the back. We want to be applying that on top. So for me, I really like the wow, the wow pads for the 2D work. Super easy to clean. Thanks for asking. What else? All righty. Uh, so, Tammy shared that she really liked, uh, sometimes if she is having trouble getting the really thin lines, mm -hmm. that she uh, will take a strand, rub it between her fingers, and then uh, lay that down. Like roll it. A lot yeah. of people roll it. I don't tend to roll it, but a lot of people do. I'll go back over and over, but yes, a lot of people do make a little twist or a little roll of the fiber. Mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. tip. Yeah, I know a lot of people like to do that. Mm -hmm. What okay. else? 
That's it? Mm -hmm. That Y'all, thank you so much. So listen, we have prizes for you. We have presents. Thank you for chiming in, everybody. Anne's been writing down names over there while y'all all have been um, playing with us. Get this out of the way. And Anne, um, you got lots of names in your hat? We got lots of names. <laughs> <laughs> thank y'all so much for playing with us today. And we can't wait to see your landscape. So we're going to draw names right now. But listen, if y'all are looking for the kit, there is a link in the description. We're on the top one. When the, the, there's a link in the description there. And um, what else do I want to tell you? We're here. We're here Monday through Saturday. So Monday through Friday, except for next Monday, because that's a holiday. Yes. You can call us from 9 to 4 on Saturdays. We're, we're here from 10 to 4. You can use the contact us page on our website and ask us questions or if you're trying to help find help finding something. We have amazing classes in our school, feldingtutorials.com, um, some really fun landscapes, uh, sunset landscapes, landscapes, Laura Riggs classes, which are always a blast. Um, Anna Repke sunset is like for the bigger, yes. <laughs> more investment of time and space and lots of other classes in between. So we we'll hope you'll join us there and we hope that you'll share your landscape. Tag us if you make it on Instagram or Facebook, just tag us Living Felt so we can see it too and celebrate with you. And we're going to give away some prizes right now, right? Yes. What are you giving away? Alrighty. Oh, right. I was so excited to draw names. Uh, so today's winners will win the Hidden Lake Kit. Yay! Yay! Mm -hmm. <laughs> or if you'd rather make a, a three-dimensional fantasy mushroom, you can pick that kit as well. Oh, that's right. That's right. Oh, and as a matter of fact, I never gave away prizes in the beginning of the show, did I? We did We're going to do that. So we're going to give away four... We're giving away four uh, Hidden Lake kits right now. So we're going to draw two names from the show watchers. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll hold you draw. Right. Okay. As long as they're not the same ones that are on this paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who do you got, Anne? I have Karen McKean. Very nice. And I have Tammy Daniels. And winners from the comments down below. Y'all comment after the live show because you are entered to win prizes too. So if we didn't answer your question, if we didn't call your name, if we didn't shout out your comment, leave a comment after the live show and you get an extra chance to win your Hidden Lake Landscape Kit. We're giving away two from last week's show, Jennifer Flory and Barbara Hoyson. Congratulations, y'all, and thank you, everyone. Hey, listen, we don't have a live show next week, we, but we do have lots more fun planned for you this summer, or with you, I should say. So if you want to check out The Hidden Landscape, you can get the PDF and or the kit with us, and we'll be watching for them on social. Until next time, if you don't know the show calendar, go to our website, click on the Learn tab, click on Wooly Wednesday, and you can see what dates we have a show and we don't have a show. Thanks for playing with us today, y'all. And be extra good to yourselves because you really deserve it. You do. We Thank love you. Thank you. Bye.